It's a common misconception that when you're designing medical technologies to impact the most vulnerable, who make up the majority of the population, that you have to sacrifice performance to meet the affordability constraints of those low resource settings. The idea is the more you pay, the more quality you get. And for many people, that means high quality care is out of reach. I spent the last 20 years in translational medicine and impact entrepreneurship. And for me, this is an ethical issue. I believe that everyone should have access to high quality care. It's also a practical issue. Business models that exclude large segments of the population don't seem sustainable to me. I want to encourage you to really think deeply about the design trade offs you think you have to make when you're innovating new technologies or companies, especially if those trade offs will lead to greater inequity or unsustainable business models. This is the mindset we take to develop medical technologies, and we've developed a technology that has scaled globally. I want to first talk about knives. There's so many varieties. There are hiking knives, cooking knives, scalpels, and our favorite as engineers, the Swiss Army knife. <laughs> If all knives cut, why are there so many designs? Imagine you were working in a high end restaurant and you had to prepare a fancy meal. Which knife would you pick? The Swiss Army knife or the chef's knife? You'd probably pick the chef's knife. And you'd pick it because the chef's knife was optimized for a certain metric. As engineers, designers, and entrepreneurs, we're used to the idea of optimizing performance towards a certain metric. But what happens when we rank these two knives based off of a different metric, like affordability? You see the common challenge we face when we design technologies the challenge of trade offs. When you prioritize one metric, like precision or performance, you might deprioritize another, like affordability. For most use cases, this doesn't matter. If I'm making a salad for myself at home, do I really need a $500 chef's knife? <laughs> Probably not. But there is a risk of increasing health inequities when you prioritize affordability and you deprioritize performance. I want to encourage you to think about this. If you spend a lot of time to understand the context deeply, you can make careful design choices that balance both performance and accessibility. And if you do it right, You might be able to get your technology to scale globally and make a sustainable business. This is the design principle that we've applied at Planoptica to address one of the biggest, most common, easily treatable, impactful, overlooked diseases in the world uncorrected refractive errors. That's a fancy way of saying poor vision that can be corrected with eyeglasses. This includes nearsightedness, farsightedness, astigmatism, and presbyopia when you need reading glasses to read closely. What might surprise you is that there are more than 1.1 billion people in the world who don't have the glasses they need. Now, many of them are in low resource settings, like this photo I took in a slum in Calcutta. But what's surprising is this is not just a problem of developing nations. This is also a challenge in high resource countries like the US, where there are almost 30 million people who don't have the glasses they need. Poor vision affects people of all ages, it affects the children and their educational outcomes, it affects economic productivity and opportunity for adults. And affects quality of life for seniors. Poor vision affects seven of the 17 UN Sustainable Development Goals, including no poverty, quality education, and access to decent work. It costs the global economy $411 billion a year. The math is staggering. If you invested a $10 pair of prescription glasses for each of these people, the net return on investment would be almost 40x. If such a large problem persists, why is the reason? The challenge is it's hard to get access to an eye doctor, to get an eye exam, and to get a pair of eyeglasses. The world needs hundreds of thousands of new eye doctors. The world needs a million new access points for eyeglasses in order to have equitable access to what we have in high resource settings and low resource settings. And the medical equipment that's designed to do the eye test, that makes it efficient and accurate, tends to be very expensive, it's not portable, and it tends to only work well when it's used in a controlled clinical setting. So, what happens is eye doctors, equipment, and eyeglasses stay far away from the patients who need them most. Along with my three brilliant co founders, we thought this wasn't fair. So, in 2014, we started Planoptica with the mission to democratize access to high quality eye care for everyone. Our hypothesis was that we can make a technology that can meet both the demands of the high end of the pyramid and the constraints of the low end of the pyramid, and that we could do it 
and make a sustainable business. We designed Quixie. It's a handheld wavefront autorefractor. It's a technology that measures your refractive errors very precisely, with the clinical gold standard of accuracy. Our design journey started by trying to understand the context around poor vision. And to do that, we went all around the world, from Arvind Eye Hospital in South India to the New England College of Optometry here in Massachusetts. And we wanted to understand different clinical practices, different technologies that were used, and how healthcare was delivered in these different contexts. We also wanted to understand the for profit demands and the constraints that the nonprofit sector faced when addressing this issue. So we met with leaders from both sides. We met with people who ran hospitals. We met with people who ran eyeglass chains and optical retail stores. We met with people who were researchers, NGOs, nonprofits, doctors. But we also met with stakeholders who were traditionally overlooked, like nurses, technicians, and patients. They're often overlooked, but if you bother to build a rapport with them and to ask questions and listen, you'll find that they have a lot of insightful ideas. Some of the vision sisters we work with in India had ideas of how technology like this could optimize the workflow of patients inside their very busy hospital. They had an idea that even their leadership hadn't realized ahead of time. There were other technicians in Calcutta who wanted to take technology in order to go see people in the slums at night when they came home from work, and this would also double that person's income. So he was thinking as a vision micro entrepreneur. And we repeated this in many contexts around the world. From that, what we were able to do is to arrive at our design goals. We knew that the technology had to be affordable, easy to use, portable, and accurate. And this also allowed us to think through business models that might support a technology having scalable impact and being sustainable. So our approach was slow and methodical, and it was counter to the current innovator's ethos of moving fast and breaking things. In healthcare, you don't get to break things. <laughs> so instead, we moved thoughtfully and tried to make things. <laughs> I'd like to share two stories of our design journey that kind of highlight our approach. The first was about meeting the challenge of clinical accuracy of high resource setting clinics and meeting the affordability constraints of NGOs on the ground in low resource settings. Clinical instruments that measure your eye and your refractive errors really precisely cost tens of thousands of dollars. Sometimes they cost as much as $60,000. Their price is driven by the cost of the components they use, which are high end, expensive scientific grade components. It's also driven by the clinical trials they run and the regulatory approvals they have to achieve, and by the business models that they operate by, which focus on high margin sales. After five years of intense engineering, we were able to navigate through this trade off and innovate through it. By developing unique optics and algorithms that allowed these components to achieve the high in accuracy of clinical instruments. And we did it at a price to the consumer, to the doctor, at one fifth of what normally they'd pay for expensive equipment. So in this case, we made the Quixi, or we made the chef's knife, have the affordability of the Swiss Army knife. The next vignette I'd like to share is about balancing usability and portability. Or ease of use. We needed Quixie to work in any setting on any patient. To measure vision, you have to align the optics of a clinical instrument to your pupil, which can be as small as two millimeters. It's a pretty hard problem to solve. To solve this, traditional equipment is big and it sits on a desk. And you'll notice the headrest and the chin rest. They're there to immobilize the patient's head. This kind of form factor wouldn't work with what we wanted to achieve. We needed to meet patients outside of the clinic, whether they're in bed or they're in a wheelchair. The handheld form factor we developed solved the portability constraints, but it created a whole new problem that we hadn't anticipated the problem of usability. If any of you have gone snorkeling with an ill fitting <laughs> scuba mask, you know what I mean. All faces are unique. There's such a large variety. It's really hard to make a one size fits all solution for this. After many iterations on thousands of patients across six clinical studies across US, Spain, and India, we were able to solve this design challenge. In this case, we were able to make the chef's knife have the flexibility of the Swiss Army knife. The result of our design journey is that Quixi meets the requirements of both the top end and the bottom end of the spectrum. Results from our randomized controlled trials have been peer reviewed and published, and they show that Quixi has, matches the clinical gold standard. That's when the doctor puts lenses in front of your eyes and asks which is better, one or two. But importantly, we've achieved this even when Quixi is operated by a community health worker. And it only takes one hour to learn how to use it. It only takes 10 seconds to make a measurement. 
Over the last four years, we've been commercializing Quixi. It's been now commercially adopted in 45 countries across the resource spectrum. We've lost count of the exact number of patients it's been used on, but the rough estimate is about 5 million. It's been adopted by both the for-profit and the non-profit sector. For non-profits, what Quixi does is it allows them to scale up their manpower and their capacity, because now they can train technicians quicker, because they have an easy-to-use technology. It allows the few doctors they have in these low-resource settings to be more efficient, and also lets them to go meet the patients where they are, so it expands their geographic reach. In Kenya, one NGO was training unemployed youth to become vision micro-entrepreneurs, so they can go to the villages and provide eyeglasses for people who wouldn't have had access. They also did screenings of truck drivers to give them glasses and prove roadside safety. Quixi has been used in telemedicine applications in the U.S. to bring health care to our vets, and it's also been used in telemedicine in Australia to reach aboriginal populations that were 700 kilometers away from the nearest eye clinic. It's been used by eye doctors who set up pop-up clinics post-hurricane in the Caribbean to bring eyeglasses to kids, and it's been used by street clinics to bring eyeglasses to homeless people in the U.S. A couple weeks ago, we announced with Fred Hollows and Sight Savers a partnership to look at how Quixi empowered community health workers could improve access to basic care services in Sierra Leone and Nepal for people in health disparity populations. What's really interesting about this study is that for the first time, we're going to map out the economics of this approach, this technological, technology-focused approach, and to, so that NGOs can better deploy their resources and reach people who they need to reach more cost-effectively. But remember, Quixi was not just designed for one end of the pyramid or the other. It's been adopted by the high end of the pyramid as well. It's used by doctors who go to nursing homes, who want to get higher reimbursements. It's used by the people who sell eyeglasses to improve customer experience. And it's also used by doctors to do home visits, concierge services, which are high-value services. It's also been used by vision scientists who use it in training camps on professional athletes. And in France, mobile opticians have used Quixi to reach the elderly who tend to live in villages. Their wait time, their average wait time to see an ophthalmologist in France is about a year long. And these opticians are able to, on demand, go see these people and bring them eyeglasses sooner. The virtuous cycle we've created by having a value proposition for both ends of the pyramid, for the for-profit and the non-profit sector, fuels Plan Optica's sustainability. By helping our partners conduct more eye exams, we help them either sell more glasses and earn more revenue, if they're in the for-profit sector, or to have more impact by delivering low-cost or free glasses in the non-profit sector. When you choose to innovate, instead of taking the easy path, you change what's possible and new opportunities emerge. Quixi has reached further than just the bottom or the top of the pyramid. Last year, Quixi was used by space health researchers in two commercial spaceflight missions. They needed a technology that was portable, easy to use, and accurate, so they could assess how microgravity affected crew's vision after they landed. It's every engineer's dream for their technology to be associated with space exploration, right? <laughs> <laughs> by thoroughly approaching tough design trade-offs and innovating through them, we've achieved a technology that meets the demands of both ends of the pyramid. And we didn't have to accept that the two ends of the pyramid had different solutions. We're not done yet. We're still designing. There's still more than a billion people to see. So I'd like to leave you with a couple suggestions for your own design journey. The first is, understand the context deeply and think broadly about all stakeholders, not just your customers. Second, always ask yourself this question when you're facing a trade-off. Is the trade-off the only option, the easy option, or can you innovate, can you choose to innovate a new option? And third, I'd like to encourage you to move thoughtfully and to make things of value and impact. Thank you. Thank you.